Hey, Phil! You know those giant noisy flying egg beaters? Yeah. How do they work? Well, Dave, why don't we ask Ben? Ben? I don't think Ben has a clue, does he? I've been trying to get a better understanding of how a swash plate works, so I've been looking at my radio-controlled helicopter. This model also has a fly bar incorporated, developed by Stanley Hiller. Here is how I think it works. If we look at the bar, we can see it's free to teeter. The fly bar is connected to the main rotor blades through mixing levers. If we want to fly forward, for example, the swash plate tilts forward. What this has done is increase the pitch on this paddle and decrease the pitch on the opposite paddle. During the next 90 degrees of rotation, the fly bar has now tilted forward. Tilting the fly bar forward has resulted in increasing the main blade pitch on this blade and decreasing it on the opposite blade. Add another 90 degrees and now the main rotor disc has tilted forward and this is how the fly bar controls the main blades. So what are the advantages of this system? Well, without the fly bar, the pitch links on the swash plate would be directly connected to the blade grips on the main rotor. This would give an approximate 90 degrees phase lag. With the addition of the fly bar, the phase lag is more like 180 degrees. To recap then, swash plate tilts forward alters the pitch of the fly bar. 90 degrees later, the fly bar has tilted forward. That's altered the pitch on the main blades. Add another 90 degrees and the main rotor has tilted forward. This has increased the time it takes for the rotor to react to the cyclic stick command or phase lag. This delay is very useful on model helicopters because without it, keeping up with the rate of rotor tilt would be very difficult. But there is something else going on here too, and that is to do with gyroscopic stability. On the fly bar, we can see metal weights which act as a gyroscope. The more weight we add, the slower the fly bar will respond. I've got the helicopter mounted to a piece of board which can tilt left to right. The main blades have been removed so we can just observe the fly bar. If I tilt the board, we can see there is a delay between when the fly bar reorientates itself to the mast. With relatively small aerodynamic paddles and relatively high mass, this is the reason for the delayed response. And of course, I can keep the board still and do the same thing using the swash plate to control the fly bar. There is then a relationship between the aerodynamic forces and gyroscopic forces, where aerodynamics move the rotor and gyroscopic forces fight against it. The ratio of this relationship can easily be adjusted using the fly bar for control. The docile control of this system is useful for flying in gusty conditions as any upset from the aerodynamics is played out over a longer time period and the magnitude of the upset is reduced. My helicopter didn't have any stability enhancing features and when the wind turned gusty it goes from very stable to very unstable. You can see what trouble I'm having in this final video before the dry shaft broke. Earlier on with the wind calm there was no problem with stability but later the wind changed direction and became gusty. I was having a real hard time keeping it under control. A huge difference I would suggest. It is only gusty wind that is a problem. A smooth headwind was even more desirable than no wind at all. You don't see much of the Hiller fly bar or Arthur Young stabilizer bar on modern helicopters. And here are some thoughts as to why. There is another stabilizing feature on rotor heads and that's called the Delta 3 hinge. If we look at my rotor hub, I chose a standard teeter hinge where the hinge is 90 degrees to the blades. I've got this represented by a bit of wood and a hole drilled at 90 degrees. It's on a pin so it can flap and the rotor blade is facing this way. So if we have a gust of wind coming from this direction, as this is rotating anti-clockwise, more lift is going to be generated on this side and less lift is going to be generated on the opposite side. With this hinge it allows the blade to go up and the other one to go down respectively. If then I decided to mount this not at 90 degrees but at 45 degrees, what happens then? What happens when this flaps now is as this blade rises due to the extra lift it's generating, 
it also tilts downwards. Can you see how it tilts? And the same happens on the opposite side. That one increases in pitch, this one decreases in pitch. This change of pitch automatically compensates for dissymmetry of lift and it reduces the amount of flap the rotor experiences. It might be obvious to some why the pitch changes, but let's imagine we put the pin like that. We'd only see a change in pitch. If 90 degrees, we don't see any pitch change at all. So depending on what angle we choose, dictates how much pitch is changing while the rotor flaps. If I had incorporated that type of hinge into my rotor heads, when the wind was gusting, I wouldn't have such negative effects of control. But we don't usually see Delta three hinges on main rotors. You see them on tail rotors, but not on main rotors. At least not in the way that I'm describing. There is actually Delta three built into rotor heads. We look at the R22, it also has a Delta three hinge, but it's not recognizable unless you know what you're looking for. Here is a picture of a Robinson R22 rotor head. And here is the teeter hinge. This is the coning hinge. And here we have the blade pitch link. If we look at the axis of both the teeter hinge and coning hinge, we can see that neither line up with the pitch link. This means that when the rotor teeters or flaps, the blade will change pitch or feather in the same way that the previously mentioned Delta three rotor hinge works. Another thing to note is that the rotor mast is not in line with the rotating swash plate. If it was, then the phase lag would be 90 degrees, but on the R22 it is 72 degrees. Rotor discs take time to change angle. For the R22 it is 72 degrees of rotation. This can be referred to as aerodynamic precession. I've been considering what to do about my helicopter and one option is to build another using what I've learned. It would be better designed and more likely to succeed. The design I would give serious consideration to is a single seat Chinook. There is some complicated psychic and collective mixing in a Chinook, which would be a real challenge. This combined with the efficiency, heavy lifting capability and excitement of twin rotors would be a great project. However, I've decided to build a smaller intermediate project first and that is going to be a flying boat or wing in ground effect vehicle. I've been in contact with a couple of people who have built them and they look amazing fun. This is James Greenberger's superb wooden wig boat. What he has achieved is very impressive and inspiring. Check out his channel for some really great flying and building videos. Another man who has successfully built one is called Kester Haynes and luckily he doesn't live far from me. He's already been extremely helpful and I can't thank him enough. He took a different approach to James and I'm tempted to follow Kester, except I want a two seater, ideally with dual controls. I think this will be safer than the helicopter and just as fun. I'm sure some of the knowledge will transfer over. After all, it's a flying machine. I've already bought an aircraft engine for this project, which I'll reveal in the next video. I'm very excited about it all and can't wait to bring you along for the ride. One last thing, I'm going to change the name of the channel to my name, which is Ben Dixie. I think this will make the channel easier to remember and share.